are you? Yeah, doing well. Let me turn up this, this volume. I just um, put a question on the chat to see where people are from. We got Sydney in Melbourne, Elle from Melbourne, Sergio from Sydney Informatics Hub, nice one. Great. Great. Can you hear me all right, mate? Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Awesome. awesome. We, um, people are still coming on, which is nice. We, um, we'll get started in just a sec. Give a chance for a couple of extra people to, to come on. All right, we might get going. So welcome, welcome everybody to um, another Data Futurology webinar. Sorry, just kick the, the computer there and the camera. Welcome to another webinar from Data Futurology. Um, so this in this webinar, we'll be discussing managing remote data teams. What's it like working in data teams? What type of things you have to uh, be thinking about, gotchas, and the ideas to, that we, through the hour, we answer all your questions. So we have a, um, in Zoom, there's this Q&A question and answer functionality. So please start putting in your questions in there. If you see questions from other people that you like, uh, feel free to upvote them and uh, you can comment on the questions as well. I'm just enabling all that at the moment. So if you see somebody else's question that you like, uh, that you want to hear an answer, give it a thumbs up and we will get to that question um, in, in sort of, we'll answer questions on the order of the votes. So uh, please feel free to start putting your questions whenever, whenever you want. And um, in general, in Data Futurology, we aim to bring you content to help with leadership in data science. So uh, one, of the, one of the key things that we see that, is, that we would like to see more of in the industry is, is to create more leaders and essentially, um, a leader can goes beyond the, just the technical side and with good leadership, it means that you can get things done, you can have an impact in an organization and you, you've got sort of um, good proof points in terms of deliverable results that then you can obviously reference on through your career and build upon. That's the type of people that we want to help, um, help grow through the content here at Data Futurology. And uh, I myself been working in, data for uh, about 20, 20 years now, which is a long, long time, definitely makes me feel old. Um, and uh, at the moment, I'm working as head of data science at a healthcare AI company in Australia. And today we are joined by Mr. Yanir. Yanir, mate, how are you doing? How are you doing today? I'm well, and you? Yeah, no, very well. Very, very excited um, to get to, to chat with you. And um, tell me, you are um, based based in in Brisbane at the moment. Actually, for for the maybe few people that that are, might might not know you yet, can you give us a, a quick uh, overview of your of your background and how you got to where you are today? Um, okay, uh, <laughs> like, yeah. So right now I work um, as a data scientist at Automatic and um, like the technical lead for, I, I called it causal inference tech lead, but really like we are currently like starting from rebuilding all the experimentation tools and we're going to do like more exciting causal inference um, on top of that. Um, and I've been with Automatic is the company behind um, WordPress.com and Tumblr and a bunch of other things in the WordPress um, WordPress ecosystem. Yes. Um, and yeah, I've been with them for three years and I've been sort of calling myself a data scientist since um, 2012. Um, 
and that was um, calling yourself as a data scientist well that, that was like a lucky accident so like i originally um like i i started off as a software engineer and um like i'm originally from israel did like an, an undergrad in israel and then i, I wanted to move out and um, wanted to come to australia and ended up doing a, a phd that i started in 2009 and i thought it like it was like in data science but not labeled as such it was like text mining and and uh -huh. user modeling um and yeah when i finished i realized that um it's a thing uh, <laughs> uh, like that, that was the year that like harvard business review came out with like the whole um you know sexiest job of the 21st century so i'm not sure it's gonna last the entire 21st century now like my team right. Like uh, within autom so like between like joining automatic three years ago and um, you know, like the end of my PhD, which was 2012, I worked at a few different companies in different like sort of data science, head of data science of capacities, so like all small companies, but also did some consulting, I had like a stint with CBA to like get a taste of the um, Corporate. corporate world <laughs> the big enterprise which was interesting <laughs> um but yeah and, and, and why do you think that the the, the term is not going to survive ah uh, yeah simple? yeah so no no it's just like you know you need to like sort of keep riding the the hype train um i was actually if you look at like the the email that was sent out i was amused because it's like it like there was some typo and it became m causal inference so i was like mm, that might give people fomo they'll be like what's m causal is that like something i need to so yeah uh, <laughs> i was actually looking it up yeah yeah there, oh <laughs> there you go oh, i need to know about this <laughs> yeah yeah and within automatic like i like we've there's like there's been a few reorgs and um <laughs> now i'm on like the team that i'm on we're calling ourselves like decision science so i'm like yeah, nice. decision scientist is the the sexiest job of the 2020s uh, <laughs> exactly yeah long gone right. yeah actually related to what um eugene said at, like that last um i think it was the last webinar you had yeah it was. was like yeah you need to support decisions so it, i quite like the the idea of decision science as a thing rather than because data science always seemed pretty vague like decision science is vague as well but if you're about supporting decisions it makes it more more actionable I exactly guess. exactly yeah. and, it's, um, <laughs> uh, and so so it's all about decision science now and in the future all about causal inference what do you reckon yeah yeah, causal influence and then M causal influence. <laughs> Love it. Um, that, that's like yeah. 2030s. You're uh, yeah. your time. No, but I think that causal influence, like it's sort of, you know, I've been like on my website and um, like blog and stuff. I've been sort of banging that drum for a while. And it does seem like there's a lot of like, it's sort of like in a state where maybe machine learning was like a few years ago where yeah, it was yeah. like you had to do a lot of things manually but there's so many like new tools and things coming out that might um, allow us to automate a lot of that stuff so um, i agree completely yeah. and in fact i've, I've told uh, my teams at work that i see causal inference as the number one data science skill of the future and uh, they, they thought that it was a you know, obviously a big call. Um, and and I, I do think that it's something tremendously important. Why why have you decided to to focus on it? Um well it's just it's more like it's it's partly out of personal interest, but I think you always sort of hit that wall if you say you like like get into machine learning and say you, you know, build a, a model for churn, then like if you just have like churn scores there's not much you can do with that like it's not actionable and you know like if often like the, the best feature is just tenure with the company so it's like okay tell me something i don't know people have been around for 10 years aren't gonna disappear um like you want to make it more um yeah actionable and support decisions around like support interventions that you know would have like a, a demonstrable causal impact on um, reducing churn like that's that's the business problem that you're really trying to solve um not yeah not prediction it's more like yeah t taking prediction to the next level and also like Correct. understanding why things happen 
Um, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. just it's interesting and and less and I think you know with machine learning as well, it's like a lot of the stuff gets automated, and a lot of you know. I'd say, I'd say when I started, I thought it's like if you're, you're not a real data scientist, if you're not building machine learning and models and deploying them. But now it's like it's it's more of an engineering thing. It's like that's machine learning engineer is a thing. It's like it's a an important skill and like it's it's a worthwhile level. But it's like I don't know. It's it's less sciencey, I guess, just because it's been so automated and like made into like a very very. Um, more rigid process where you have like a bunch of best practices that you follow and then you, know, you have your machine learning model exactly exactly now there's there's more yeah more of a process more of an engineering task instead of a science and definitely on the on the causal inference side you need a lot more knowledge you need to be asked the right sort of questions the right sort of controls the, the that's um and as you said like coming up and definitely comparable to the earlier days of machine learning from a few years ago. That is awesome. Um, so mate, let's, we'll, we'll get on to, on to uh, discussing running remote data teams and, um, in, in, and I'll give sort of an overview of some of the topics of questions that we got leading up to the, to the webinar. But I know that in your case, you've been working as a remote data scientist for a number of years, is that right? Yeah, so three years now. Yeah, so a, a, a exceptionally well qualified to be answering any and all questions in this front, and um, and obviously a lot more experience than what um, a lot of people like myself. But we had to we had to go remote remote as a result of COVID. So essentially, the experience there is like three months, and you got three years. So really, really good. So some of the areas of of questions that we have is around onboarding. Um, time zones, so managing uh, different time zones. We got ways of working. Um, yeah, what what type of processes do you have on an ongoing basis? Recruitment around how um, how to do the recruitment when it's global, etc. And then there's a few sort of varied questions around um, what the change has been for you over over this COVID and. Um, any and, and things like that. Do you have any any preferences on where to start? And if um, if people from the audience that are here today, if you have any preferences, put put it on the on the chat, um, so so we can know. So essentially, we've got onboarding, managing of time zones, ways of working. Um, recruitment and other is sort of the broad categories that we have. If you have any specific questions that you would like us to answer, put it in the question and answer section and then people can vote the questions up. Um, so put, put, please put in there any, any particular questions. But if we, if we start around with the, maybe with the ways of, ways of working, uh, Yanir, what is, what is your, your day and your week look like how um how do you structure it as a as a remote data scientist and what does that look like with working with people in different time zones um so yeah i've, I've sort of fallen into this routine where um i like because i work with like on my team i have we have people from europe and the us um, so it tends to like in the morning is good overlap with the US and in the, the, the evening it's a good overlap with Europe. Um, but like the, I don't, there's, there's usually no, no reliance so much on, on the overlap. So we don't have many meetings, but just as a general day, uh, usually because, you know, most people, like most of the company is based in like all around the world. There's only, there's about... So the, it's about 1,200 people in the company, and um, and they're like fully distributed um, in about maybe 50, 60 in, in Australia. Like I think the numbers have gone up. Yeah, wow. But obviously, not, not all on the data. Like the yeah. data division is like 25 people or something like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just like usually, like the morning, I tend to like catch up on things and like you know, see if it's like discussions I need to respond to, and um, 
you know, code reviews and, and things like that. And that tends to be like sort of the more responsive part of the day, but and tend to like work a few hours and then just take a break for a long time. Like when I was back in Valentine, it used to be a surf break. That was part of my uh, talk, but like, like now I just- Surf break, right? Hmm? There was like a 10 a.m. surf break? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, depends. Like in, in winter, in winter it's good to go at 10, 10, 11 a.m. In summer, it's too hot in the sun that time, obviously, you need to like, you know, shuffle around. But uh, <laughs> like uh, in Brisbane, I, I go to the gym and stuff like that. You know, I tend to like, I don't know, I think I find that like just working, say, eight hours straight isn't, isn't the greatest. Um, <laughs> and I think like a lot of people at the company are sort of like that. Um, just you break up your day in whatever way suits um i tend to wake up early so i start to do a few hours then like do other things and then do a few hours later um and yeah that's sort of like that's the usual thing and you know given that well now that like things are opening up again we can also travel around like last last weekend we went to um sunshine coast and also stayed a few days of the week um <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, cool. it's it's quite, yeah. and you know, you you structure your day based on that. So you know, it's like it doesn't preclude like traveling um, yeah. when COVID's not on. Um, so yeah, that's like so sort of that how that's how the days tend to to go. And I, we don't. I think that's that's one of the big things about like because automatic is fully distributed and has always been. So there's a strong culture of doing things asynchronously. So. Yeah. We use like Slack for Slack and um, a tool called P2 for like, which is basically a WordPress theme, which is like an internal forum for discussing things. So okay. there's very little reliance on um, on meetings, like meetings that you actually need to show up to. Um, so what does that mean? How and, and I guess compared to your time in corporate, how many? Um, how many meetings is is the client the right time the right question or is it an amount of time how how much uh how much of your time do you spend in meetings and say a week or a month now compared to when you were in in corporate land um well much less <laughs> there's like um i would say it's like say a few hours per month um yeah yeah like, like in like single digit hours per month yeah Wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> which is like in, in the corporate world is a few hours per day. Uh, <laughs> exactly. yeah. yeah. So for instance, I have one thing, you know, like there's um, stand up meetings. So we do stand ups, but there's like a tool on Slack called Geekbot. And there's a lot of similar ones that basically just asks you during your morning, you know, what did you do since yesterday? What are you going to do today? Um, anything you're blocked on? And then it just sends it out, and but there's no expectation of like answering at the same time as as the rest of the team. Um, and actually, that's something that we did. Um, so before Automatic, I was with um, Car Next Door, which is a startup that's mostly based in Sydney, but uh, like the CTO was in Adelaide, and they started hiring people in Melbourne. And I think now they have people in India as well. So, you know, that was also even though most of the team was in Sydney, we still did like that asynchronous stand up on um on slack um which yeah meant that like you know it, it given that everyone is sort of like in australian time zones it was like sometime in the morning for everyone but it wasn't like you don't have to be like at like 9 30 yes at a, at a specific place and do a, a stand up um that's interesting meeting. Yeah, and then and how and then so the the few face to face meetings that you would have, what what are they? Um, it varies. So right now, um, so I have like a, a meeting with um, with my team lead, which is like you know to sort of sort out like managerial stuff, and um, so he's like he acts as like the 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 project lead, and I'm doing like more of the technical leadership stuff on, on the project that we're currently on. Uh -huh. And we work in Sprint. So we like, we have like, we find that like, if you have no Zoom meetings at all, it's, it can turn like it, it's so, 
you sort of lose the humanity. Um, I think because you forget that there's like people and not not just like avatars writing things yes. um, on chat and <laughs> think that sometimes I know you. So it's like so we do a bit of like sort of project planning and retro to like sort of sort out like you know big picture stuff yeah. though like a lot of the stuff gets gets deferred or like does like work ahead of time to like sort of do, do the planning work and then like on the team itself we also have just like you know sort of an hour a month where we just like hang out and you know it's often does nothing on the agenda except for like how you're doing and like you know stuff like that and um yeah and in the the stand-up thing that we have it also asks you like sort of like how's your weekend and sort of all these like little um social questions so it's not right. only just work yeah i mean it's not um it's not quite the same as being in like a, an office but it does help you know, making it not all about work yeah definitely so then so then that means that you wouldn't you would never have a um a face-to-face -face stand up at a particular point in time uh is what it sounds like does that increase the the need for for planning and, uh -huh. and are there sort of um you know sprint planning sessions or retro sessions that that are face-to-face -face or is that uh, yeah so so for the current project we're doing like the the retro like face to face but we started off like asynchronously so we put up a board and then um you know people put like you know whatever they want to discuss at the retro and then we discuss it face to face and then um the planning as well we sort of like do a brainstorm of like what what do you think are the the top things that we should do for the next sprint yeah. um and then we so discuss it in in person and then like go back to do it asynchronously like breaking it down into like little tasks you don't really need the entire team there discussing every little detail but if we sort of like align on the big big goals and like with the retro we sort of um get you know get those right. um blockers out of the way or like things that people are upset about that that won't don't often don't come out very well over text so if there's like something that's been frustrating um and you know that it does like a time to discuss it then it's um you know it it prevents like the sort of um, discontent from uh, <laughs> exactly from, from yeah. up. Yes. Yeah. yes and um and looking at the at the questions and for everyone listening in please put your questions in the in the q a so the question and answer section and uh, vote for any questions that you see there. Um, uh, a few of the questions, and before I start reading them sort of individually out, but a few of the questions are asking about the, the efficiency of the face-to-face -face communication and, and, the, and in particular the spontaneous uh, conversations. Mm -hmm. So that whether, that if, if you had to uh, organize a, a meeting with somebody and have sort of a, a more what may seem a more structured conversation it may take longer or it might be slower than sort of bumping into somebody on the hall or in the mm. kitchen and be able to just sort of have a, a rapid rapid exchange mm -hmm. um, what what have you seen on that front uh, have you seen it um, work well what what type of tips do you have have you seen a detrimental um, to the productivity what what are your thoughts mm. so there's a few things there like um so at automatic during like normal times when you're allowed to travel um we do meet up a few times a year so like it tends to be a few different like levels of meetups so like a team level meetup a division level meetup and then like a company level gathering um which all got cancelled i was like supposed to go to hawaii in march and it got cancelled two days before <laughs> and it was supposed to be like the the data team like was supposed to meet in japan last month and also oh, so had you been to those places before had you been yeah. to hawaii, japan <laughs> but yeah. still would be nice to go <laughs> um, oh, I wanna go. <laughs> yeah but um yeah so it's it's it has like um um yeah so that that that's like the company sort of relied on that 
to have like more of the spontaneous conversations because like you don't see each other at all like sometimes you don't interact at all throughout the year like say in the company-wide meetup but then like yeah. the it's set up in a way that like allows people to generate this extra interaction so for instance you for lunch and dinner at the company level meetup you're assigned to people that you don't know so there's like a little oh, tool wow. that you say if you've met someone and then like it randomizes people so like it does a lot of effort to create this like sort of um you know so sort of these these conversations that wouldn't happen otherwise um and yeah like meetups in general like they tend to be pretty so like even the team level one you go for like not seeing people at all but then like to spending a full week together like spending the like so it does really like recharge sort of the relationship um mm-hmm because you build a pole with people and you know like and yeah like you have these conversations that you know you might not be bothered like setting up a meeting to have or like it might like you wouldn't send a slack message for but then like you know it does lead to a lot of things later on so that's on hold for now um but yes yeah, so one thing that they've started experimenting with is like doing time to facilitate these meetups but like sort of not in real life basically they call it mm-hmm. real life meetup so you know sort of like conferences that you know just over zoom but where people commit to being online certain times and having like sort of like sessions and and things like that i haven't attended one yet and yeah i don't think it's quite the same because you don't <laughs> it's like i think in general like going on zoom is a bit of a chore it's not yeah. the same as you know going going for a coffee with someone like even if it's just for like a casual chat yeah um yeah it's yeah it's i feel everyone is feeling it like at this point um so yeah i wouldn't like say that like this thing you know that that is one of the downsides of remote that you can um yeah you can mitigate but it's not like you can't completely replace yes um you know yes. The, the serendipity of like face to face um interactions um and yeah there's an, another tool that we use like it's called like it's a bot called um donut um that you know you join the channel and then it randomly assigns you to to meet up with with a different person um wow. it's actually yeah it's it's meant for also like co-located teams that's why it's called donuts because you go and eat a donut together nice. uh, but then like yeah it's like we have one for mm-hmm. all the data people in the company like it's it's not like you don't have to join it but um had some good good conversations with that which just for people that i wouldn't just say hi to on like for no reason but then you know um we ended up having pretty pretty good conversations that sometimes lead to like the the sort of that's good that's yeah. really good so that's donut and what was the name of the of the asynchronous stand-up um, um geek bot yeah so geek bot. it is yeah yeah so andrew no, so was... not not kick geek um, oh geek yeah geek yeah geek bot. great andrew was yeah. um, asking on the on the chat cool and um so yeah so it sounds like there are it sounds like there are some opportunities that that are sort of lost in terms of um serendipitous conversations that you might mm-hmm. have with people but that there are ways to mitigate it and it, and and then there's the relationship building time that's dedicated in order to create the, the cohesiveness in the company so that's mm-hmm. that sounds really good um and going through some of the questions so if you have if you have any questions put them in the in the q a and the top voted one uh, is asking about how do you facilitate knowledge sharing and collaboration with people across different squads and different teams, uh, given that people working remotely don't have the opportunities to chat in the kitchen um, during their official day-to-day work. So essentially when you're not working directly with people in the same team or squad, how, how do you collaborate with them at a sort of from a company perspective? Um. Well, yeah, it, it varies, like, because it is, like, people are open to, like, you know, you reaching out to them, but, yeah, like, if you don't know that that person is working on that thing, yeah. uh, <laughs> like, uh, how, how would you know in, like, um, an office environment? Like, because I think, like, it, even, like, if you go, say, something like CBA, 
there's a bunch of different buildings and like you don't like and even within the building it's not like you know who to yes. who ask sometimes for things um like when you have a um, hundred people who are just on on data on your like level um so i think it is like a, a common problem for like as companies get bigger um so yeah not sure like it's sometimes like it's just asking around and hopefully <laughs> or like searching and knowing what to search and and like there are like company-wide channels if like if you say uh -huh. you don't know who's working on something and and things like that like uh yeah i'm trying to think of like a situation where this was a problem um yeah because it often it often goes unnoticed but it's it's both a problem for for companies that are face-to-face -face as well as mm. you know remote and and um, some of the things that i've seen before is is that sometimes teams have sort of like an, an open showcase kind of like mm. a showcase to say hey we're working on this come here about it um yeah sometimes that works well but it's not it's not um it's definitely not a solved problem for face-to-face -face either as as you say yeah uh, and and a lot of relationships within the business are um or people that create relationships in the business try to mitigate that through through their relationships and essentially being in con in regular contact with people yeah. from, from different areas and that takes time to build up and maintain yeah and and one thing that's good about like say async is that a lot of the stuff gets documented and so th these p2 forums they're they're all um they're open to the entire company so you can if you're oh, interested right. in a spe in what a specific team is doing then like you you can go and subscribe to their p2 and there's also like a, a general p2 where it's called first day updates where every team or division like they post their um update so it's like it's a lot of stuff to read <laughs> but if you're particularly interested in interested in say what the what is the data division working on there is like a weekly update that you know is on that general video and then like if you want to dig into like what a specific team has been working on then you can go and in, into like their their forum their p2 and and subscribe wow. to that or and usually there's like at the top things like it, it's encouraged, but not always sort of like, what are we working on? What are we responsible for? So, and there's like a pretty good um, internal search tool just yep. for the, that sort of stuff. So if you want to see if someone did X, then yeah, it is it is usually searchable and fileable, but it doesn't, you know, if some, if people are calling things different things and <laughs> like it doesn't completely eliminate duplication, um, and it's impossible, like at the size of the company, to like follow everything that's happening. So you'd hope that it makes it up to like you know the the higher level, um, um, you know, updates. Yeah. But but it's it's a lot more searchable and a lot more accessible. Mm. Um, so that's that's a huge that's a huge positive. Um, and just just so we don't uh, sort of leave people behind there's a question about what is asynchronous communication um and, and it says in a remote data scientist and that's that's uh, asynchronous communication is when people give updates in their own time so they're not having sort of a stand-up meeting everyone face to face to give their own updates everyone is doing um at a, a different point in time and it's being written so then others can read it so that's the asynchronous you do it in yeah. your own time um, yeah, so and we use um, Slack as asynchronous as well. Like, <laughs> if, um, so if like I ask you a question on Slack, like even if you're online, I don't usually expect like an immediate answer unless like you're say on a team that yep. like like the IT team that like keeps the systems up and you're on call, then yeah. I'd expect an answer. But like we're not more, like if we are not like um. Like even if you're online, you're not expected to respond immediately. We just um... and that is awesome. So yes. result, <laughs> oh, this is great. So as a result of this, you can obviously do a lot more deep work, and you can, mm. and you can solve harder problems because uh, you have the time. You don't have the interruptions, and and you you can schedule yourself. Um, huge benefits there, obviously. But I wanted to ask you about the the management structure. Does it lead to less management 
like less need for management compared to uh, a corporate? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, ideally, yes. Because <laughs> um, like the, the idea, and I think like automatic, <laughs> like actually, um, <laughs> I love that answer. <laughs> no, but, like it is like <laughs> something that automatic, um, you know, optimizes for in hiring of like people who are like more autonomous and um, actually like everyone who joins the company um, has to do like customer support for the, the first two weeks, no matter how senior they are. Um, and that's like, in addition to just understanding more about the products, it's, um, it also helps in like sort of knowing the internal tools and knowing how to find an answer yourself. So it's like four years ago, but there was like a big flow chart of like, okay, you have this problem. Have you tried this? Have you tried this? And it's like, it's not just for like customer support things. It's like, here are all the places where you can look for an answer before you ask a person. Um, wow. you know, so sometimes asking a person is, is like you end up there because, you know, or like if you're already in conversation, but like the idea is like, you do want people who are self-starters. Um, yeah. yeah, so, and and happy to, so you, you do need like, I think less, like you need management, like, you know, patient platform. Um, the, over the years, so well, like automatic has existed for 15 years and it's accrued a bunch of different ways of running A-B tests. Mm -hmm. um, so we're unifying, like, not like we're gonna replace them all with one way and then like build more exciting, like, experimentation tools on top of that, like geo experiments and all that stuff that's more on the causal inference feel like more exciting than maybe testing. But the, I think like it's a, as a result of the extra autonomy and like it does also extra autonomy on the team level, then sometimes it's like, it, yeah, you do end up with like um, less, like people just going out and doing their own thing. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'll, I'll solve this this way. It's like solves the problem for now. Um, and then you end up with a few different, you know, tools that do the same thing. So you do need the management and sort of people that are, that have like a broader view of what's happening across the company and across the um, divisions to um, sort of bring things together. But it's not so much to like, you know, look over your shoulder every day yeah. and make sure that you're doing your job. Um, Interesting. Like, yeah. Give so, direction and yeah, and like yeah, I think that managers and leads at the company do tend to like facilitate these discussions across teams, be more like act as ambassadors uh -huh. um, for teams. That's really good. That's really good. So so yeah, the yeah increased uh, documentation, increased autonomy, um, and then and then there is uh, a need for management to connect the the dots across the organizations. Yeah, really great. And I love the idea of the flow chart. Man, really good. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is around data security. So um, I, so it says, how do we handle data security? I assume that the question comes from a, a, a perspective that a, a lot of resistance to hiring data scientists to work remotely is around how they can access the data, whether, um, whether there's sort of data sovereignty requirements that need to be met, whether people can sort of download the data, uh, whether you have to work specifically on on certain on certain infrastructure, what what is um, uh, your views there? How does that work in your um, in your work? Well, it's it's like how you handle the, and any security concern. I think like it's also a problem that you you hit like on like on like with most collocated teams like. The, the, a lot of the data travels on the open internet unless, and there are ways of securing it, like, and, you know, when it gets from the data center to your machine, like you'd want to make, like, have a VPN or something like that to, um, you know, like, in our case, there's, like, for a, a bunch of stuff that you need to access, you need to, like, um, go for a proxy that, like, you know, actually identifies you and, and, various things are also password protected and, and so, which is similar to what you'd have like you know, with a company that's just like, it's not in one place with, a, with one computer that <laughs> doesn't leave the office. Uh, it's, it's things that I think you need, like these days you'd need to think about 
anyway. Like I'm not a data security expert, but the, like the, the IT people you know, are aware of it and, and yeah, like, you know, are securing, like, yeah, you're just securing the data as you would, I think, as like a co-located team. Yes, that makes where, sense. Where the data center doesn't live in the same building. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And um, the the company you work for, Automatic, where where are they based? Um, there's technically no real office. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> there's they actually are actually the they are reopening. Like, or oh, they were planning on, um, like they had an office in San Francisco and then they like closed it because no one showed up and I think they're opening a smaller space just to have like meetings with investors and stuff like that is just easier but um, there's like about 50% of the people are in the US and then like maybe 25% in Europe or 30% and then the rest are all over so it's originally an American company but it has like there's a, an Australian entity and the, if there are a few sub subsidiaries in like UK, Ireland, South South Africa, because they bought like WooCommerce there. And actually before COVID started, like end of last year, they bought um Tumblr back from um from Verizon and they Tumblr was co-located in New York. So it was supposed to be a bit of an experiment to see how it's like to have like sort of a semi Okay, because like people were starting to work from home, but then they were all forced to work from home. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> but I think that the plan is to still keep that New York office. Um, just and are, are people hired by the entity in the country that they're in? So, so would you would you like or do you work for the Australian entity or do you work for the US entity? As in, like from a contract perspective. Yeah, I'm I'm an, an employee of the Australian entity. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but like all the like as far as like your day to day doesn't matter. Like yes. it's just well, like you know. Yeah, no, I was different asking. legal constraints and different like you know I get have to get leave and have to like you know, it's it's actually like have have to be tracked. Whereas like in general they say in the US they don't track leaves because they don't have to. Um, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And I was asking because um, a couple of years ago, or like say a few years ago, there was obviously the rise, or there was a rise of, of remote work uh, from companies in the US, and a lot of people were working within the US, but then people were sort of traveling and and being overseas. And I thought that there had been kind of like a a cut down from the US perspective to say that US companies or companies based in the US can only hire people based in the US. And if they're remote, they they have to be in the US. So I was wondering whether that meant that creating the subsidiaries around the world meant that gave them the flexibility to to hire people around the world. So it sounds like it sounds like yes, which is great. Yeah, the way to go around it. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. There, there are like some various complications around that of like you know taxation and stuff like that. And um, there are actually companies that I've seen a few startups that are trying to solve it and make it much easier to to deal with say compliance across all the different countries because say places where you don't automatic doesn't have an entity then they're hired as international contractors but that's not always like something that people want to do because like in some cases in like depending on where you live sometimes you have to start a company and like you know get an idea like you know it's um it's more messing around whereas like it's it's easier often to be an employee and you know you get paid in in Australian dollars here and get the super and everything else. So, um, yeah, it's much easier for me from an employee perspective. But if you're a company that's trying to, you know, hire around the world, like starting a subsidiary in every country where you yeah. have an employee, can be like <laughs> too much. Like there's like seven. I think there are employees across seventy countries in at Automatic. So, wow. But most most countries they don't have a subsidiary but uh, yeah right wow really long tail and how many in australia did you say i think it's about 50 or 60. Um, yeah. yeah nice um so the the next question looks after it's from emma and it looks after the the other skills required in data science besides the technical side so the question is how are you developing your business relationships 
and strengthening commercial skill development of your team members working remotely. Uh, assuming that you're intentional about this and would like to share your methodology? Um, well, one thing that we have had, um, uh, like, have experimented with is just like sort of embeddings in other teams. So actually I was sort of a part of, in, in the previous reorg, I was a part of the experiment where a bunch of us just moved to the marketing division. And really? We like, yeah. Um, created like a marketing data team under marketing. That was when marketing scientist was the sexiest. <laughs> but that's like 2019. Yeah. Uh, nowadays it's... 2019. Yeah. <laughs> now it's the decision scientist. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think like... Hmm? Yeah, like these, these sort of things tend to work well. So like actually having people that are, you know, like it, it's the whole like the whole hub and spoke thing where you you do want you don't want the data people to just hang out with data people and and it's actually is in a way easier with with remote um, company where you can just like okay say like you're gonna go and like for three six months and and spend time with with marketing and then you like learn the the language and you you know you get. I get a better understanding of the business problems and, and things like that. So but now it's sort of shifted more to like more centralized data, but I think there's, there are like, so there's a move back and forth because um, you, you sort of, you need to move back and forth because you just get stuck too much, say on the technical side and say like what we're doing with the experimentation platform, we are um, like, team doing like sort of ongoing consultations with people who want to run experiments um, so that gets you that exposure to um to the problems that that they actually have rather than the problems that we would like to solve because they're interesting uh, <laughs> yeah business people sometimes have boring problems unfortunately uh, <laughs> Well, I'm glad it's it's in a way it's glad I'm glad to hear that it's still a problem um, in um, <laughs> you know in, in sort of futuristic working uh, ways of working. And um, so, when you go across to other teams, how does that work? Like, say you you go you go across to marketing. Um, do you join their standups? Do you stop doing your data science work or or only take yeah. on marketing work? How does it work? It varies. Like there have been like a few different sort of ways of doing it. So like one way was that like basically like back in a different round, uh, like um, one of my teammates, she went and did like basically, w yeah, joined a few of the standups, like started following the P2s and worked like exclusively on, on their problems. And then there's like, a, yeah, I think that that's, basically how it will work like because especially like say marketing is a big area so you'd want to like are you like focusing on acquisition like retention like uh, you know you'd, you'd want to have some focus and not like be in charge of marketing in general um yeah so basically that like basically just like start interacting with them and, and working on those specific problems but say from as a data scientist it's from a data scientist perspective um so or like if you're an analyst, like you'd maybe be in charge of their like dashboards and, and these sort of um, things and just get more familiar with yeah, the problems that they're trying to solve. Yeah, no, that sounds good. And uh, next question is is from Phil. Hey, Phil, um, Phil Briley. Um, he's asking, how do how does promotion work? Um, that's a good question. It's like <laughs> automatic has a as a good um as an interesting um approach to um promotions, like <laughs> um because it's sort of like compensation is detached from like the day to day performance. Like say you have like your performance review, but then like the compensation review is separate, where you basically like you get compensated based on your level. Um, and like, there's more of a, like the managerial roles are more well-defined where you have like a team lead and then like a division lead and then like sort of a higher high level um, 
yeah, there, there aren't that many levels in that um, yeah. thing. Yeah. So it's yeah. like so, sometimes it's just like moving between divisions, yeah. like the, the it's still pretty flat. Um, and how with how the many tech, hmm? how many levels? Uh, well, it varies. <laughs> like it, it actually. Um, so, but it sounded like yeah. five, maybe. Yeah, it's like it depends on which part of the business. It can be as little as three in some places, and like in some places, it's like yeah, five. Yeah. Um, but it's not. It's also not seen as a promotion at all. Like if you check, if you become a team lead, you don't get a raise or anything. You just get different work. I wouldn't say more work. It's often more work, but um, <laughs> but it is it is a different type of work if you're you're managing yeah. people. Um, and there's not like I've been so. Sort of, trying to promote a more technical career ladder. And there have been a few attempts at that, but there's nothing like formalized across the company. Yeah. So it's more like people know what you're doing. <laughs> and there's no, there's no, like, actually like my, one of my many titles that distinguished <laughs> data scientists, that was just like, you can pick your own title and like one of, um, they like me and another day a scientist you went for like principal like okay i'll be distinguished just <laughs> so um and i was like oh that that actually looks good <laughs> i'll keep it <laughs> so yeah I, I wasn't promoted to distinguish data scientists and we we, we both like <laughs> We we originally were like, now let's call ourselves directors of data scientists. Yeah, yeah. And then like, <laughs> and then the head of data was like, now don't don't like do things that imply that you're directing the data science <laughs> across the company. You can call yourself like a fancy adjective, but not uh, <laughs> don't imply a, a hierarchy that's not there. So that's how I became a distinguished data scientist. I should change well, it to a <laughs> distinguished decision scientist though. Yes, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> the sexiest job of 2021. Yeah. <laughs> decision scientist. Um, yeah. How no, that's... to hire decision scientists. It's like, it's going to be a whole thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's here, man. <laughs> um, so that sounds, that sounds like, um, like people want to do good work and contribute and mm. and like they're not necessarily chasing the career or that they're not wanting to climb the ladder quickly just for for the sake of climbing the ladder yeah uh, how you would get and you definitely get a lot of people like that in corporate um so in this in this case it sounds like having a flat structure having a decentralized workforce focus on the on the outcomes um it, it, it creates people, it has a culture where people are wanting to contribute. Do you think it helps that it's that it's a technology company? Yeah, probably. I think like in, in tech in general, it is more common to have like the sort of uh, technology advanced. Uh, did you see that like, I think, yeah, having that idea of, I guess it comes from academia as well. Like, like in, in thinking of data science, like, you know, is it, say professors don't generally want to like many professors probably don't want to manage yeah. like teams they want to like do interesting research and collaborate with researchers and like but you know like the sort of like the management is more of a necessary evil of like <laughs> working on like interesting problems um so yeah i think it does help and it's, yeah it is a different different culture and like automatic specifically it's also started off like from wordpress which is a an open source project and there's still like very close connections to the open source community so it is like you know where people like sort of you know in in the open source world you don't necessarily get a a title but if you contribute a lot and like your contribution is visible then you know you do get acknowledged and yeah it's basically what you get out of it but and and it is like it does you know there is a sense of seniority, it's just not formalized, like, and it does contribute to like salary and stuff like that. So yeah, so I do, I'm like, I don't feel like I'm worse off being at automatic. Like it's not, it's not a, a non-profit kind of thing where you like, um, yeah, I'm just gonna do this for fun. Uh, yeah. So yeah. yeah, like despite not having those titles, you still get compensated well. And the idea behind like the compensation also being separate from like the, um, the review process is just that like the 
you, you shouldn't need to think about your salary. It's like, it's something that's there, you're getting paid well. They try to keep it like fair and, and you know, competitive with the market for your role and your level of seniority in the market. But, you know, it's of, you're not chasing like the, the next raise or bonus. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that comparison when it comes to, to pay, is that local or is that international? Like from um, yeah, so they, they do do it internationally. Like they, it's, it is, um, you know, it's sort of, it's tricky. Like I don't know like all the, it's, yeah. but like things change like in terms of, you know, say if the, the like a lot of the company like makes, makes much of its money in US dollars. So, but then like, you know, like if the Aussie dollars goes like up, like if it went back to parity, my salary cost would be much higher, but they won't like reduce my salary as a result. Whereas, yeah. Uh, so like once you make a raise, then you keep it that way, um, at least where in places where you pay with the local currency. Um, and that's what they attempt to do. So they do try to make it fair across countries. And I know that like people in, um, so the countries where the cost of living is lower than like it is pretty competitive yeah. um, and like more than competitive it's like you you get paid very well for <laughs> compared to like people like um whereas in australia it's competitive um but yeah it's it's tricky like i know that some companies there's a, a company called Basecamp. yeah they like put put out a lot of stuff on you know their remote process and like wolf reading they wrote a few books on the topic they're way smaller they're like 60 people and they normalize salaries to like the top um 10 in san francisco uh <laughs> so like regardless of where you are in the world so yeah. they pay very well but they're a much smaller company um so they can afford it i guess and they're, but they're, they're not hiring much i don't think like that it's something that you can do like any company can do like if you you have like thousands of employees yeah that makes sense and they got a big a big investment from from jeff bezos um, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense i'm sure that helps <laughs> <laughs> uh, mate the, the next question is something that i've been wondering as well it comes from chris and um the question is any thoughts on building relationships with with stakeholders when everyone is working remotely and then they say, I started a new role last week. Congrats, Chris. And uh, they're working from home until October. So uh, Chris is finding it challenging to meet their stakeholders. Um, well, I think, yeah, one thing that could work in this case is just like reaching out and, you know, setting up calls just to, to chat and, and like sort of get to know you calls. Like I actually just got a new um, team member. And one thing they're doing is just, setting up a, a meeting with each one of the data team leads to um to just chat and get to know you and sort of like um you know le learn about what the different te data teams are doing so yeah that's like i think one case where unstructured synchronous time works well of like you know, just reach out and say like i'm on this i'm gonna like you know um, and yeah, I've seen that work pretty well of just like having like these one-on-ones that, you know, like people are generally, I think, pretty open to it. Um, yeah. I would yeah. do yeah. that. Especially if, um, if like in distributed companies, it sounds like you have more, more time to do work. So people might mm. be more open to, to having those, those meetings. Um, if they're still trying to implement a legacy, um, way of working i found that when um the company that i work with that i work in when we went remote as a result of covid we i was just in zoom calls all day mm. like literally back to back zoom calls um at one point we we decided to start a couple of meetings five minutes past the hour just mm. so people had a chance to go get a coffee you know go to the toilet because yeah. otherwise you're just like Anyway, back to back. So, um, <laughs> but I do, I do agree that uh, reaching out to people will, will definitely be, be helpful. Um, yeah. And uh, the next question is around recruitment process for, for teams. Um, what, what qualities do you look for besides the, 
the data science technical skills? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it automatic does a lot of emphasis on, on written communication. So that's um, um, like the recruitment process is like, you have like a, an interview and, you know, like sometimes that's like just chat, like it, it varies from team to team. Like I can go like my process. Yeah, it was like, yeah, I think like the, the initial this chat with the head of data, it was just like a, a Skype chat, like just written. Um, and then like had like a, a written task where like, you know, send a, send out the problem, you have get some time and do a test and get back. And then there's like a paid trial. So um, you basically pick a, a task that's not too big, not too small, and you work as if like you're a part of the team already. Yeah. Um, so, and then that gives you an idea, like it, it, it's good for, for both ways. It's like, it, you know, because it's different from like the way things work in many companies, then you also the, the candidates get, get an idea of whether they would like this sort of mode of work. Um, but like just to give an example, one one trial we had recently for a machine learning engineer was around like a anomaly detection, and yeah, it basically like the, the team lead for the for the team that was hiring was like just laid out the problem and said like okay, we want to like we have this internal system for um, anomaly detection, we want to like you know extend it to these metrics like and like want to improve the evaluation how we do it so like. Uh, the candidate went and broke it up into like these parts and you know like basically they but like there's a lot of emphasis on like how, how does the candidate communicate throughout this process it's okay and that's why it's like also like a paid trial it's not like you don't yeah. get paid a huge amount of money but it's also like you know it's not something that you, like you would be done with in an hour or a few hours like you know in-person interviews so um yeah so i think as far as things that are emphasized are these like communication, like written communication skills, I think are way more important than in traditional workplace. Yeah, that makes sense. And how about from a technical perspective? What, what are the types of skills that uh, you would look for for people to join the team? Um, well, it, it varies depending on what, what sort of, what we're trying to feel like, you know, it have all the, the usual the usual stuff but yeah it like does does you know data science in general decision science is a broad field so like you don't necessarily want someone who can do everything um but yeah it it does depend on on the need um so yeah basically what you would like say for the machine learning engineer like the, the emphasis was more on the engineering side rather than like you know very deep um like the algorithm. algorithm like yeah actually i like the, the machine learning side or like you know you don't expect a machine learning engineer uh, machine learning researcher you want someone who can like build software and identify um problems in it and like you know, so yeah um that's all but yeah it, it does vary from all to all and you know but it's not it's not a huge data team so you do, do tend to like optimize for different things across like the different different data roles, whereas say um, for software engineering, there's like a team that's dedicated for hiring software engineers to the company. So they have a much more like sort of, I think list of um, things to tick off and, and things that they go for. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and we might do a couple last questions. I know that we're, we're over in time. Are you okay to do yeah. A questions? Yeah, one of them is around, um, whether there's a lot of a lot of changes in priorities over time, like you, um, you know, and I guess this is compared to corporate where things might pop up, you know, during the sprint, sometimes during the day, and you have to change your your focus and the the you have to sort of drop some work, pick up some other work, and then hopefully come back to to the original work eventually. Mm -hmm. Do you have this this quickly changing priorities as part of the uh, as part of your work week or, or month? Um, yeah, like we do, we do try to like be responsive to say like stakeholders and, and, and other teammates. So 
um, especially around like you know if you shoot with like unless you're working on something that's like you know an emergency in itself like something broke um, I like personally and like try to prioritize unblocking other people before I get on to like the, the, the more deep work stuff that I need to do um, like for myself uh, <laughs> so yeah like that's that's why I sort of start the day with like looking at what things I can I can help unblock um, but yeah sometimes yeah it, it happens that you know you didn't account for something like something you know is bigger a, a problem is bigger than it seems or something like broke and you do need to be able to adjust and, and reprioritize, but try not to do that too much. Um, Cause otherwise, and that's why, you know, you try to like, we currently work on like three week sprints and like of one week of unplanned work. So we try to like push things to the oh, unplanned um, time. That's a good yeah, way. That's like something that Basecamp talk about as well. They do like six weeks, like they don't do quarterly planning or anything. They settled on six weeks it's like the, the longest a human can plan yeah. <laughs> can plan in detail and not try to like do it tackle things that can't be done in six weeks um so i find that like i think that's yeah just in general the, the whole like planning long term is how like you have intentions but then like reality gets in the way yes uh, yeah <laughs> yeah definitely um the, the next question is from, from William. And um, the question is just, um, the data science field needs, seems to be populated by experienced hardcore scientists or young grads looking to get on board. There seems to be a gap for skilled practitioners in other fields who can bridge the gap between business and the analysis in various domains. Do you agree with this? And what are, what are your thoughts? Mm, I don't know. Um, like. Yeah, I'm not hundred percent sure. It seems like there there is like like it's just the fields become so broad that it, it's like yeah, I think there are all kinds um, of people people around. I think like that yeah, that, uh, there is like the a very large cohort of people trying to get into the field and new grads and especially with all the the new degrees that have popped up and, and with the hype and stuff. And yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's great to have new people in. Um, and yeah, there are people that have been around that haven't necessarily called themselves data scientists, but there are quite a few sort of in-betweens that don't, yeah. I think that there is, yeah, a broad range. I'm not sure if it answers the question. No, I think it's good. And then the last, <laughs> last question, which is right. from Corey. Um, the question is, do you think remote work would discourage a culture of innovation and, the, uh, and, and discourage a culture of innovation and challenge the existing thinking uh, due to lack of physical collaboration slash workshops in person? So is there, is there a tendency of staying on the lane that the, the company or the thinking is, is going on um, versus sort of breaking the mold and innovating? And is that due if it does that happen and is it due to a lack of face-to-face -face meetings yeah, i think it's more of a culture like it's depends on the the company culture um like if you think say back to um like academia in general like there, there is like a lot of like they've been you know if you think of the sources of the internet and even before that like academics have been collaborating remotely for many years like Newton and Leibniz and all like those, those people like the there is like people have been innovating without having the face to face time um, for generations uh, <laughs> since um, like inventions of letters and stuff like the, there is value in like face to face time and that's why say automatic has like these meetups in normal time so like you don't don't discount it but you don't need to like be in person all the time like eight hours a day uh, and i think actually now, now now that i think back to some some of my office days it does um, you know you get like offices where like you do spend all of your time just having coffee and hanging out with people um and that also <laughs> discourages a, a culture like yourself you're in there to like <laughs> keep the seat warm and um yeah so that's not that's great right. for innovation either like sometimes you just need to get out and get some fresh air and um that will like 
get the juice as well. So I think it's it's more dependent of on the culture that's like the organization um, sort of ties to um, create rather than remote yes or no. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense, mate. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us. I know I found it definitely super interesting, super enlightening. And there's there's a lot of a lot of ways of working that that you have that I'm keen to to bring into a company that's way more face to face. But um, the, your approaches have definitely opened my eyes, and and it allows for more deep work, which I think is more of what's necessary in the world. So thanks thanks a lot for taking the time to to share your journey with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome, thanks everyone. So uh, we will let Yanir go. We'll end the webinar here. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, the webinar went live on YouTube, so you can go back and share it, watch it again, um, whatever you want. And it's coming up on the podcast in a few weeks as well and the, just the, the audio file. Thank you so much for making the time and hopefully see you at the next one. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Yeah.